Well, I'm doing a series on uh, praise, and I've called it the sacrifice of praise. And this is part three of the sacrifice of praise. And my subtitle is Before God's Throne. The sacrifice of praise before God's throne. In part one, we spoke about the fruit of our lips. Part two, we said that our sacrifice of praise is unto the Lord, and we take it a little further to talk about worship before God's throne. Though we live on earth, we are part of a heavenly family. The whole Bible is about heaven and earth coming together. We see that right from the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Jesus says, when we pray, we ask, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants us on earth to live life as it is in heaven. And so, true worship on earth must mimic, it must replicate what is done in heaven. And, uh, and so we're going to look at, at that and we're going to look at a picture of heavenly worship and then we can see how we can apply it in our earthly worship. We do not worship here on earth to make ourselves happy. We worship to honor God before his throne in heaven. You know, many times when it comes to praise and worship, we are focused on songs that make us happy, and we dance, and, and we, we think that it's all about our happiness, but all of worship is God's pleasure, is towards God, and we have to be mindful of that. So we're going to go to the book of Revelation, and we're going to look at chapter 4, uh, this week, I would deal, I'm dealing with chapter 4, and next week, I'll take it a little further, a part of chapter 4, and then I'll go to chapter 5 uh, as we see heavenly worship. Revelation chapter 4 and verses 2 uh, to 5. Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. This is the Apostle John telling us of his experience Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now you have to take note that John says he saw all of these things because he was in the spirit. That means that really for us to also uh, have an encounter with the heavenly, we have to be in the spirit. Uh, even though we live in the flesh, we have to be mindful of the spiritual realm. There is one word that runs through the whole of Revelation chapter 4 and also in the passage we read, and that word is throne. Throne. And the word throne uh, in the Greek thronos means a seat of authority and rulership a seat of authority and rulership. And that word, throne, is used 14 times in this one chapter of Revelation chapter 4. 14 times we read the word throne. It is the key word in Revelation chapter 4. That means that worship is done with a throne in mind. And, and so I'm going to address that uh, in, in our session today 
uh, so that we can be thrown conscious as we worship before the Lord. Everything happening in Revelation chapter 4 is related to throne or thrones. And uh, there are three statements that I want you to pay attention to. The first is uh, God on his throne. The passage speaks of one who sat on the throne. Somebody sitting on the throne. This is the main throne that the visioner is talking about. And this throne represents God's rule and authority. This throne is the highest throne in the universe. And the passage uh, describes it in, in, um, in a kind of uh, metaphor, allegory, uh, because the whole book of Revelation, uh, uh, John talks about things like something. So he would say uh, it's like emerald and like sadios and, and the streets are like this because he's seen things that he has no description for and there's no earthly equivalent for what he's seen. So he has to use like. That means that the, the closest description I can give to this on earth is like that. It doesn't mean that the person is sadios. He says that's how it looks like because there is no earthly description for this heavenly expression. So he says, I saw one who sat on the throne, and he's like this, and he's like that, and the throne is like this, and, and then he says a, uh, there is a rainbow, and it's like emerald. It doesn't mean it's emerald, emerald is green, uh, but it means that he's having an experience that is stupendous. It's huge, it's magnificent, and he doesn't even have the language to describe it. But the first throne we see here, or the first thing we see, is a throne and someone sitting on it, and later we, we know it is God sitting on his throne. So that's the first thing we see uh, uh, here, and I'll come back to that later. The second thing that John sees is elders, they are around the throne. So remember, there is one on the throne. There are people around the throne. That John calls them elders. Elders. From the Greek word presbyteros. Presbyteros, uh, uh, is, that's where we get the word presbytery or presbyterian. Uh, it's, the, it's the concept of elders. And in the New Testament, elders... Uh, immediately means older people, but it also means people of stature, people of rank. So here the Bible says that there are elders, people of rank in the heavenly realm who are around the throne. And, and John describes the elders as uh, clothed in white. They are clothed in white. It's interesting how he describes it. They are senior in rank, and there are 24 of them. And a Y24, uh, it's, uh, the pastor doesn't uh, clarify why there are 24 elders, but the general understanding is that it represents perfectly uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. In the New Testament, we have the 12 apostles of Jesus. So it represents the entirety of the church. The fullness of the church is represented here through the 24 elders. And the passage also says that these elders are also sitting on thrones. So there is the main throne of, of, of God. There are other thrones, and the elders are sitting on the thrones. So there are a group of people sitting. God is sitting. The elders is, are sitting. They're clothed in white, and they are wearing a crown. That means that they have some rank. They have uh, a place of honor. The third thing that John talks about is the glory of God. And it says the glory of God is coming from the throne. The glory of God is coming from the throne. And, and in the form of lightning, thunderings, and rumblings, which he calls voices. 
Now you have to understand that the lightning and the thunders are in response to worship given to God. It's very important. So, one on the throne, those around the throne, and what is coming out of the throne. There's somebody sitting on the throne, there are people around the throne, and the throne is producing something. And what it is producing is magnificent. John also says he sees seven lambs, which represents the seven spirits of God. Seven is the number of perfection, so he's basically saying this is the fullness of God. It's been ministered out of the throne because of what is happening in this throne room. This is the setting that John is talking about. True worship is focused on God and his throne. God and his throne. And this is important. We know God is our father, but he is also the king of the universe. We must know him as father, but we also have to know him as king. We love God as our father, but our father is also a king. And there are times when we love him and, and, and we have a casual relationship with him because he's our father. And there's another time we have a formal relationship with him because he's a king. The, the closest I can come to explain this, I saw it when uh, the former queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, uh, was alive. Uh, she is the mother of then Prince Charles. So Prince Charles is a son to the queen. So uh, in private, she calls him mom. And I'm sure they have their mother-son relationship, they have fun, they laugh, and, and all of that. But when they come to public, she's not mom. She's queen. And he bows and addresses her, your majesty. Doesn't call her your majesty at home, calls her majesty because she understands this woman who is my mom is bigger than just my mom. She is also queen. Remember that God who is your father is not just a father to you, he's also the king of the universe. And you have to learn when you come before him in public, he's not just your father, he's a king. You have to know how to relate to him both as father and as king. When we see God as father, there is no worship there. Who worships his father? Nobody worships his father. You talk to your father. You, you have conversation with your father. You relate with your father. You get advice from your father. Your father buys food for you. Your father buys stuff for you. But you worship a king. You worship a king. And if you don't know God as king, Worship will never come to you because you never see his majesty. All you see is my father. Some of us see God as friend. We sing, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. And that's true. But the one who is your friend is also a king. It's like if you are a friend to the president. And maybe in private you call him by a nickname or whatever name you call him. Hey, whatever, buddy, 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 buddy. When there's a state function, you don't go say, hey, buddy. No. Everybody will say, that's disrespectful. They know he's your, father, your friend, but in this forum, he's not sitting here as your friend. He's the ruler of this realm. That consciousness has to be among Christians that when we worship God, we're not just worshiping him as our father, but as the king of the universe. And as king of the universe, he deserves the highest adoration. And we're going to see that very shortly. Now, if you don't understand that, then our worship will be focused on ourselves. You know, so sometimes we come to church, people say the worship was not sweet. And what they mean by the worship is not sweet is, 
It didn't move me. I didn't benefit from it. It wasn't sweet to me. I didn't, it, I didn't dance. And they were singing the song, wah, wah, holy, oh. I want something to make me happy. Listen, it's not about you. It's not about your happiness. It's not about your joy. It is before the throne of God, and we are singing to him. Our worship is not for ourselves. It's not for personal consumption. A lot of what churches do in church service is personal consumption. It may, it may be nice, but God is out of the picture. The people are just playing games for their happiness. But worship is not about we separating ourselves. <laughs> it's not about we. Dun, dun, uh, where, that, no, 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 no. You can do that at the Bobobo party. But when you come to the house of the Lord, the worship is before his throne. It is him we are addressing, not ourselves, not our pleasure, not our happiness. And those of you who come to church and sometimes say, the song doesn't move me. It's not supposed to move you. As for this song, when you sing it, it's not doing me anything. It's not supposed to do you something. It's not for you. It's for the Lord. Everybody says for the Lord. All right. So now... We're going to look at a little further. Go to verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 4, from verse 8 to verse 11. And it's telling us what happens in this setting. And the four living creatures, having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. I will focus on two forms of worship in this passage. The first one is a proclamation. Worship is a proclamation. Everybody say worship, worship. is a proclamation. And what is a proclamation? It's a, in this sense, it's a public statement about who God is. Both the four living creatures and the 24 elders say something to God. They make a proclamation. It's to God, but they also want the universe to hear it. This is what we think of God. And so they make a proclamation. And if you examine the, pro, the proclamation closely, it is deeply theological. It is also poetic and rhythmic. And it uses repetition to emphasize a point. So we'll take a close look at the proclamation, and I'll break it into three parts. The first part of the proclamation is the proclamation of who God is. And so they say, holy, holy Holy. In the Greek, it's hagios. And it speaks of something that is clean and pure, without blemish, and stands on its own. They're saying, God, you have no comparison. You are him, one of a kind, set apart. The God is in a class by himself. There's none like him. And they repeat it. Holy, holy, holy. Why do they repeat it? It's for intensity. 
You know, in, 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 now in English we say things like extremely holy. We can say very, very holy. You can even say very, 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 very holy. Because the very creates intensity for the holy. In those days, they don't have these qualifiers to say very, very. So they repeat the word many times. So when they say holy, 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 they are saying you are holy, but you are more than holy, and you are deeper than holy, and you are holier than holy, and you are holier. And you know, that's the intensity of what they are saying. God, we don't even have the right words for you. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy to infinity. Intensity of statement. That's the first theological statement, who God is. The second is how we know God, how they know God to be. This holy God, who is he? He says, Lord, God Almighty. Lord, God Almighty. Want you to pay attention to something. There is a rhythm going on here. Holy, holy, holy. Three words. Lord, God, almighty. Three words. And the third statement is about how God exists. Who was, is, is to come. Three, again, holy, holy, holy. Three statements. Lord God Almighty. Three statements. Is, was, is, is to come. Three statements. So there is a parallelism. There is poetry. There is rhythm. There is a composition. That means that these words are not just being spoken. They have been thought through and they have been structured well to give to God. And if you actually read it both horizontally and vertically, they say something. Horizontally, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, is, is to come. If you read it vertically, holy Lord, who was, holy God, who is, holy Almighty, who is to come. Whether you're reading it, horizontally or vertically, they are making a statement. So this is not just something that is being said. The speakers have thought about it to say, God, whether we, we look up, we look down, we turn around, you are the same. You are holy, you are almighty, you are the one who is and is to come. What does it tell us about our worship? That means worship songs should be thought through. The words of worship songs should be thought through. We can't just come and just throw jumble some meaningless words together and because they, they have a nice beat, it's worship. No, we have to think about what we are saying to God. Just like somebody who wants to write to his girlfriend that he has just found. Even in normal terms. I mean, you don't just, uh, hi, baby, what's up, baby? No, no. The brightness of this day has given me the opportunity to pen these few missives to you. As the moon is to the sun, so am I to you. You are my sun that shines at the daylight. When you're writing to a human being, that's what you do. When you're going to give a speech at the Jubilee House, you think you're just going to say, hey, man, today I just feel like, what's up, man? I need to say something. No, you're going to structure a word and a phrase because you're going to speak to the king of Ghana or president of Ghana who is just elected. So how much more you're going to talk to the king of the universe? You think you should just go and say, Lord, I feel you, I feel you, I feel you. Lord, I feel you, I feel you. Oh, God, I feel you, I feel you. I feel you. No, 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 no. You have to think through what you're saying. You can't say, Radie, Radie, Radie. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, you, you, that's your sentiment. But have you thought through what you're saying? Is it theological? Does it have weight? 
Does it give honor to the person you are saying it to? Does it tell you how much you respect the person? That's what the angels are saying. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The proclamation has to be well thought through. And it's time that when we come to church, we sing meaningful songs. I like the songs we sang in worship today. What Pastor Ella sang, she, she didn't know what I was going to preach, but it was what I'm, I'm preaching. She didn't know. And I was just, I, I pay attention to words. That's why we put them on the screen. You can say, aye, 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 aye. What is aye, 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 aye? Because a lot of songs people are singing as worship have no meaning. So there is proclamation. Everybody say proclamation. And then there is something else that is taking place. That's the second form of worship is prostration. Prostration means the Bible says they fell down. Total surrender of all we are and have to God. In addition to making a proclamation, they prostrated themselves before God. And it is also divided into three things that happened. There. The first one is there is honor. They fell down. When the passage opens, the 24 elders are sitting on the throne. It means there is a time for sitting in the presence of God. But when the worship starts, they said, this guy is bigger than us. Although we have thrones, his is higher. So they go down. They fall down. They drop. They get down from their thrones. You cannot come to God and still sit on your throne. There is honor. And then there is adoration. The Bible says they worship him. They bow before him and they worship him. And the third thing you see is submission. They cast their crowns before the throne. At the beginning of the story, they are sitting on thrones with white robes and with crowns on their head. At the end of the story, they are off their thrones. The crown is off their head. And they don't care whether they wear white or not. They are on the ground. Do you see what is happening? It tells us two levels of relationship we can have with God. There is time we sit with God. We talk with him. He's our father. We have a relationship with him. And then there is a time we know we are not his equal. And that's what the 24 elders recognize. Although they have their own thrones, they realize at a certain point, we have to bow to the one who gave us the throne. We have to take the crown back to the one who gave the crown to us in the first place. And in our worship, there is a place of honor when we honor God, when we adore him, and when we submit to him. Submission is deep in worship when you say, I sit on the throne because he put me on the throne. I have a crown because he gave me a crown. And at the end of the day, the crown belongs to him, the throne belongs to him, the glory belongs to him, and the honor belongs to him. This morning, I want us to just get this clear, that our worship is before the throne of God. So although we are here on earth in this auditorium worshiping, we must see ourselves as John saw it in the spirit. We must see we are before the throne of God. 
And what we are doing is not for our pleasure, it's for his honor. We're not in church to make ourselves happy. We're in church to honor God. And as we keep him as the center, then what we say, what we proclaim, and how we act physically, all of that is directed to show our reverence to him who sits on the throne, who has also given us thrones, who has made us powerful, who has made us strong, who has made us kings and priests unto God, who has redeemed us by his blood. And next week, we are going to examine further uh, this level of worship that goes on in heaven. Let's rise up on our feet for a minute or two as we just proclaim the holiness of the Lord. Lift up your hands to God, not to yourself. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's our maker. He owns us. We belong to him. He's our father, but he's also our owner. All we have belongs to him. The breath in us, the life we have, the body we have, the honor we have in life, the privileges we have, the wealth we have, the opportunities we have, position we have, the thrones we sit on, he put us there. And this morning we come and cry, holy, holy, holy. Let's begin to speak a proclamation to God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, just begin to declare, declare the glory of God. Declare his beauty. Declare his majesty. Honor him. Oh, yes, Lord. Holy God. Holy God who is. Holy Lord who was. Holy Almighty who is to come. You are the owner of my life. You are the center of my life. You are the beginning of my life. You are the end of my life. My days belong to you. My life belongs to you. My breath belongs to you. My body belongs to you. My position belongs to you. My dreams belong to you. My hopes belong to you. My expectations are yours. You are my beginning and my end. Outside of you, I have no life. You are my life, O oh God. You are my life, O oh God. You are the breath I breathe. You are the song I, sung, I sing. You are the melody of my life. You are the rhythm of my life. You move me, Lord. You direct me, Lord. You order my steps. In you I have all things. Outside of you I am nothing. Praise and honor belongs to you. With my mouth I praise you. With my lips I worship you. With my breath... I give all to you, Lord. Just talk to him. Just declare. It doesn't have to be a melodious song, but it has to be a proclamation. It has to be a proclamation from your mouth that surrenders to God, that submits to him, that gives all to him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Lord. Father, this morning we are creatures whom you have created come before you we know you as our father but we know you as our creator and as our king the ruler of our lives the owner of our lives the owner of our days the owner of our breath. 
the owner of our beginning and our end. We yield all that we have and all that we are to you. Be magnified in our praise. Be glorified in our praise. Let our praise be towards you. Let our minds be centered on you. And let our thoughts be filled with you, Lord. Thank you for this knowledge. We acknowledge you as our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.